Hi, everyone. I'm Shanali Basak, financial correspondent for Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg News. With me, I have Max Levchin. He is the CEO of Affirm, one of the leaders in the buy now, pay later space that has simply been exploding and really targeted as a key competitive uh, industry to the biggest banks. Max, thank you so much for joining us. You know, when we talk about buy now, pay later, I think we really have to start with the underwriting process. There's this sense that you're able to capture consumers that are left out of the traditional credit industry. Who is being left out and how are you changing that? So that, that's a great sort of thing to point out about BNPL. I'll give you a five second story. We we're just chatting before. So 25 years ago when I was a lot younger and uh, infinitely less aware of how the world works, I came to the US as an immigrant and I promptly went to a very good school for computer science and had no credit record whatsoever. Not only that, I also took out a credit card on campus like everybody else did back then and had no idea how it works. And so missing a couple of minimum payments trashes your FICO score and having no credit history basically renders you credit invisible. Now, at the same time, I was about to graduate with an extremely employable degree in the early 90s while the web was exploding. So anyone in the right mind should have been offering me excellent credit ratings and or at least credit rates. And instead I was declining credit day after day after day. And so immigrants, especially immigrants with excellent education and earning capacity, folks that have stumbled in the past through lack of understanding how the world really works and then taken a decade to correct their FICO score, so on and so forth. Like that's a giant pocket of availability. And then just lots of people in the last 10 years that have actively opted out of credit cards. The millennial and Gen Z generations both watched 08 with horror and basically said, okay, so borrowing money gets you into trouble. I don't, can't understand the fine print. I am just not gonna use them. And so the debit movement is very real. There are a lot of people out there, most of them young, that said credit cards are for special emergencies or not at all. And they have neither the credit nor the credit history because they're not using a revolving line to, to build it up. And so these folks are all, what I would say is are generally speaking doing the right thing for themselves financially, but are not helping their credit score. And you have to build new models, new ways to underwrite to, to include them in the system. Well, I think there's a common misconception about buy now, pay later, where people think that if they use the product, that there's never an interest rate associated with it, that they are not subject to fees. You know, uh, there's still a need to really read through the fine lines, especially as this industry grows, right? I mean, what would you recommend consumers be wary of? Um, well, I'll quibble with one thing, not with a firm. Uh, one of our core values of the company is no fine print, sort of answer my, my own point from the, from the previous question. Uh, so we've been in business for 10 years. My proudest stat is we have never charged a single penny of late fees or any really either kind of fees, which is great. Uh, that said, there's definitely every financial product is something that the consumer has to understand. Um, in the case of, and the nomenclature is still obviously being hashed out, this is so new, um, what a firm typically calls split pay or pay in four, most often does not have interest associated uh, with uh, with the consumer side of the equation. Um, most players, I believe, charge late fees, we do not. Uh, some players charge all kinds of funky fees. That is an allergy inducing behavior from a firm's point of view. And so we, we of course, charge none of those. Um, and then there's also pay over time, at least that's what we call it, or a variety of other monikers. And that's where you can borrow and pay over still fixed term. So there's no revolving um, over months, sometimes even a year and a half, et cetera. And in those situations, in our case, roughly um, half the transactions are interest bearing or in the other half is is zero percent where the merchant basically subsidizes the the cost on the consumer side in all of our cases there are no late fees there is no deferred interest there's no gimmicks and uh, that that is a quintessential piece of who we are and how we conduct our business i don't think that everyone must do the same thing but uh, we, we certainly believe that our success and our brand is in a large part due to this idea of not kicking the consumer when they're down and trying to make money in sort of the, oh, you're late, great, now you'll pay me more. So what's really the barrier to entry in this industry as so many more people start to adopt it, including some of the biggest card companies and banks in the world? Uh, so I think 
you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to believe the barriers to entries are there to try to jump over. So it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, always, it's always good to have a competitive market. Our advantages and what I think is really the, the moats that we've created around our business have been, we are a real engineering shop. If you look at our partnerships, anything from Shopify to Walmart to Target to Amazon, all these companies are enterprise grade demanding, if you will, from their scalability, from the scalability of their partners, their reliability, availability, all, all of those things cannot just happen because you're really good at marketing. You have to build a real engineering team. You have to be really, really focused on being there for your partners. And we've really invested in it. Obviously, my background, the DNA of the founding team, the DNA of the larger team is really rooted in engineering. That has been a, a, a winning feature for us. The other side is sort of where we started. You have to be good at underwriting. Like we've lived in a decade of very benign credit environment. Um, you can sort of believe that maybe it's all going to work out, but everyone who's been in, in financial services long enough knows that it goes up and it goes down. You have to be very rigorous. You have to constantly test your models. You have to understand how to manage risk. We believe we're very good at it. You can look back at our public numbers. Uh, we have managed through the pandemic before, after very, very well, and continue to very much focus on risk management. Um, the part about being consumer friendly is core and true and important. And I think a huge barrier to entry or competitive mode for a firm has been this consumer delight where when the customer calls and says, hey, I'm late by three days, what's the late fee? The most delightful thing for all parties is to say, there is no late fee, please get current and all is the same, the price does not change. Over time, as you repeat on a firm, you realize that it is a better alternative than a credit card. Credit cards will absolutely charge you interest, it'll compound, and there'll be a late fee. And none of those things apply to a firm. We don't use compounding interest, well, it's always simple. There's this point that you made a little earlier, though, too, about the credit cycle that we're in. And I'm curious, and this doesn't need to be only about a firm. I'm, I'm really asking a question about the industry of buy now, pay later. As we face markets that may not go just one way forever. Do you think that there are some concerns in the, the broader underwriting process across the industry? Will some people lose money here? In the immortal words of Warren Buffett, when the tide goes out, you'll know who's swimming without pants on. Um, you know, I think it, it's really not my job or, or ability really to see the underwriting methodology of other players in the space, but I can speak to a firms relatively competently, and uh, we spend an enormous amount of time making sure that we are prepared and that we have both the early warnings and the controls and the systems to manage credit. Uh, but I do think that that's when you get tested, that that is what ultimately distinguishes those in credit space from those that really shouldn't be in it, what happens when the, when the economy goes down. I certainly believe that there'll be players that'll find themselves watching their losses widen and having to deal with that. Max, you know, it's funny. I think every time I talk to you, I ask you about the secret sauce. What's behind the technology that makes a firm different? I mean, and again, you, you know, you've been part of the PayPal mafia. You, you know how payments work. You've built this system to do it differently. So what inputs of data do you take about your consumers that may be different from how the entire banking industry has done this before? You know, and as I've said before in these conversations, uh, if there were if just one thing, like the, the one thing you have to know, it would be hard to defend. Presumably over time, people would, uh, would, would erode that advantage or take that away. Um, there, there's certainly a handful. In terms of kind of the, the cut and dry answer, what is the, what is the data? Um, you know, it, it has to be a whole collection of new features that, and, and you have to continuously mine for them the in feature in the machine learning sense of the word, uh, you have to continuously look for new signal as you try to eke out another little bit of approvals without increasing your losses. Uh, and, and we look forward both on the anti-fraud side of things as well as the credit underwriting. Credit is made more complicated, of course, because there's a significant body of regulatory restrictions on what you can and cannot use, and you have to look for all that extra yield while staying very, very straight and, and clear of any regulatory uh, prohibited um, methods. That said, the one thing that makes a firm very unique, we went through the trouble of building a two-sided network. We know what the consumer is buying. One of the things that's true for pretty much every major scale payment network, the issuer and the acquirer are a different bank. That means that 
the merchant where you transact is known to the issuer, but the merchandise is really not. There is a lot of value in knowing what it is people are buying. If you can sort of imagine what is your repayment profile, your, your willingness to settle your next bill, if there's pressure in personal finance, it has to be different between a bicycle they used to get to school or, or to work versus um, something that you've already long consumed. I think those are fundamentally different. Credit card industry, traditional banking, traditional lending, generally speaking, does not differentiate for lower ticket items. Like obviously, when you're buying a house, the bank very much knows what kind of house you're buying, and that underwriting is very precise, and the rates are very low. If you're using your credit card, all the bank really knows is you're putting it all into a big bucket, and it will revolve, and they'll make some money. That attention to the exact purchasing skew level data, as, as the jargon goes, is a big part of the original advantage that we've created and something that we can continue to build on. So I want to pivot a little bit here because the payments landscape is evolving so quickly. And I would love to get your thoughts on where cryptocurrencies start to play into what the future of payments look like to you. For sure. Um, and I, I imagine you saw we announced our uh, entry in, into the crypto space as well. Um, so here's my take on it. Um, first of all, crypto as the idea and sort of the mathematical structures behind it is beautiful and is just worth marveling at. And I, I spend my copious free time reading about the new research because it is just frankly so cool. Um, the volatility in cryptocurrency prices to me continues to render it a fairly poor instrument for value exchange. I think there's the, the stable coin genre is very different and very cool. And I think US government has something to say, hopefully fairly soon, about how they think of it. And I think that will start making cryptocurrencies a medium of exchange that is worth being really on top of as, as a payments provider. That said, it's maybe the best, possibly the best asset class in terms of performance and appreciation of the last five years, probably 10 years. The reason we entered crypto is authentic to a firm's mission. Our, our job isn't just to be a payment provider for you, it's to improve your life through financial products that are transparent and honest and clear. It made a lot of sense for us to say a couple of years ago, you should not just spend money, you should save it. So we launched a savings account that's been very successful. We're really, really proud of what we've done. It pays an excellent rate. We see a lot of savers within the firm ecosystem now. The next sort of chapter there made a lot of sense to say, all right, you know what, you should participate in this crypto economy in a safe, reasonable way, but you'll get better rates. And so part of our savings account will feature ability to save crypto essentially. And so in that sense, I'm very excited. I, I really want to see what our consumers choose to do. We're, we're, we're really interested in, in seeing the, the behavior and, and the engagement there. As a payments medium, I think stable coins is kind of the where, where it's gonna have to go before uh, before I'm completely convinced. So interesting because just a few weeks ago, really, you had Jamie Dimon, the CEO of the biggest bank in America, saying, you know, saying a firm is one of the big competitors here and saying that the entry away from just buy now, pay later into more debit and banking products, you know, creates a new form of competition. He said that during his earnings, uh, 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 you know, call with investors and analysts. You know, I'm wondering how you answer that. And you had mentioned crypto as part of the savings product here. How does that start? Start to make you more competitive when it comes to the big banks. Okay, first of all, Jamie Dimon mentioning a firm as a competition is incredible flattery, and I'm sort of blown away that I, we, we've made it to that next rung. Um, I, he, he's an extraordinarily uh, successful leader in our space, and I, I certainly look up to him. I'm sort of blown away. I didn't realize he actually name checked us, so that that's crazy cool. Uh, that said, I think. Um, Finance is as a rapidly evolving space. We try to build products that improve consumer lives, and um, there's more to it than just payments. So we are, of course, launching all kinds of new things, like this debit plus card that we announced. Uh, is you know it, it, it's uh, it's something that we're very excited about to bring to market. Uh, crypto is, I would argue, a feature, at least in our case, a feature of preserving money, saving money for consumers. It's a little bit less clear to me what other players are doing. I think traditional financial services uh, players, you know, large banks, do have some thinking to do. I think they have gotten very, very comfortable making a lot of money on things like late fees and, uh, and revolving interest. And buy now, pay later 
some, some call it revolution. I, I would call it the unbundling of the credit card. I think what's really going on is the credit card for the new generation just doesn't work. It has to be more transparent. More transparent means every purchase is visible. Every purchase has a an end date if it's paid over time. I think it's a different product. We, we think that's what Debit Plus looks like, but I think a lot of traditional financial uh, service providers have to ask themselves the hard question of, am I willing to reinvent my credit card portfolio or is that just too much to ask because that's where majority of the profits come from? I'm wondering because this could be true for humans, for people, you and me, but it could also be true for smaller businesses. And you work with Spotify, uh, Shop Shopify, I'm sorry, I keep on calling it Spotify. Shopify, you work with Amazon. I'm wondering what the opportunity is for smaller firms to start standing out and using financial products like you're offering. So there's already fairly healthy growth and, and competition in the small business version of Buy Now, Pay Later. Um, I'm not sure they're using the same branding, uh, but uh, there's lots of companies that are now entering that space or providing more transparent finance and uh, in, for, for small businesses and even larger businesses. And it, it's very exciting. I'm, I'm really actively watching what's going on there. We have our own little initiative in providing capital to to merchants as well. And we partner with Shopify, as you correctly pointed out, on that. And so th there's definitely something to be said for it. No, you know, nothing to announce quite yet from us, but uh, it, it's, it's a really interesting space. I think there's a fairly blurry line between consumers that are trying to take control of their finances, not pay extraordinary fees, not pay late fees, not pay deferred interest. And those same people that just happen to run a small business or own a small business, and they look at their consumer side and saying, that's really great. Why can't I have it for my small business too? And so I, I think that demand is natural. The market is pulling uh, for, for new, new solutions. And I think about small businesses and also creators, you know, this whole concept of the creator economy. I mean, is this a place where a firm can make a bigger splash? Absolutely. I think the creator economy movement in general is very exciting. Um, Shopify certainly seems to be taking some very active strides towards that. And as a partner, we will be right there with them. Uh, I think ultimately, a lot of the creator economy is all about simplicity of the experience, feeling that you are in control, that you are emotionally bonding with the item that you're purchasing. And uh, I, I think that that's very, very connected to what we offer. And what, one of the things that we stand for in the consumer's mind is, you won't regret this. This will not make you feel like you got yourself into debt that you can't get out of. Like it's all very clear and very transparent. And so we we are a natural conversion and uh, you know sales lift uh, product, if you will, for for the creators as well as uh, more traditional merchants. Max, before I let you go, what's the single biggest innovation that will change the future of finance in the next year or so? Is it like too piggish to say debit plus? I, I, I have not been excited <laughs> more about this product uh, like this uh, maybe ever in my life, but it, it feels very obnoxious to uh, point a finger at, at our own um, our own work. I'm, I'm very bullish on debit plus. I think that that, that should be on the record. Um, I think um, I think my guess is there will be some really thought, I hope there's a really thoughtful play from the US government around digitizing the dollar. I think that's not an industry innovation, but I think if there is a soon to launch, because I think other economies are doing this, then US dollar as the reserve currency of the world will continue to thrive. I think the ability to have much better clarity and accountability around usage of money depends on, on that happening. And if this happens, it'll just create a giant field of new opportunities, anything from much lower costs to move money, much better way of tax enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm very much holding my breath for that. that. That's something that the Treasury, et cetera, has to decide to do. So uh, it's less an industry thing, but I'm, I'm very, very curious and hopefully excited about what's happening there. Yeah, we're looking forward to keeping an eye on it and hopefully touching base with you again soon. That's Max Levchin. He's the CEO of Affirm. I'm Shanali Basak. Thank you so much for joining us.